Oh, good evening, everybody. Wow, it's good to see you as we gather together here in God's house to again just come and offer him our praise and our worship. How good is it to be able to do what we're about to do, to be able to come in God's presence and know that he is here and to hear him speak to us through his word, to hear him uh, uh, forgive us in the words of absolution, to have him touch us as we receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, the very body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, and to be able to join with brothers and sisters in Christ and bring all of our sin and our brokenness and our hopes and our fears to the altar and know that God is here to, to help us through it all. Isn't it good to be able to worship? I'm glad that you're here with us uh, as we do that today. Uh, those of you who are joining us online, we're also thrilled that you are with us as well and pray that your worship with us is uh, as beneficial to you wherever it is that you're sitting as it is for us sitting here in our chairs. Uh, so a few announcements before we dig in today. Uh, we're going to talk today about something you've probably never, ever worried about, worry. <laughs> That's the theme. We're talking about worry today. It's this beautiful passage of scripture, Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says, do not worry. And we'll talk about a life that can be full, uh, uh, full of meaning and purpose when we let go and let God. So I can't wait to dig into the word with you as we talk about that today. All right, then uh, again, we're going to keep this in front of you. You know we're celebrating our 75th anniversary as a church, and we are just celebrating God's blessings for these 75 years. There's been so many great stories and remembrances that we've been hearing. God has certainly been uh, at work in our midst using Faith Church uh, to share the light of Jesus into our world. So we're celebrating those 75 years. Our actual anniversary is February 13th, not very far from now. And then to celebrate that day, uh, we'll be gathering together on February 18th. That's a Sunday. By now, you should know that we only have one worship service that weekend. Uh, that will be that Sunday, February 18th at 10 a.m. at the Lawrence Memorial Chapel on College Avenue. Uh, so there's no Saturday night worship, no Monday night, no Sunday morning worships here at our, at our sites. But we'll all be together, one church at one place on the 18th at 10 o'clock. I can't wait. I hope the place is so packed that you've all got to stand. Um, <laughs> it fits 1,200 people, so I think we're going to be okay. But, you know, that would be wonderful if we just packed the house and we could say thank you to God for 75 years past. And then after that, you know, we have our lunch at the uh, Hilton Paper Valley Hotel. Uh, that, that lunch is at 1130. And we'll just head right down from Lawrence, right down the street to the Paper Valley for a time of storytelling. We have a lot of our retired workers that are coming back. Uh, they're going to share some memories of their time here at Faith and at Celebration. And so we'll have some good storytelling and some good celebrating. And that's all tied around our 75th campaign uh, to uh, the uh, capital campaign we have to prepare ourselves for the next 75 years. So that's the day that you'll also make your commitments and your pledges. So remember to bring your commitment cards along with you on the 18th, uh, as we'll all walk to the altar and make our commitment to being a part of the next 75 years as well. All right, so February 18th, it's a huge day. Already, would you do me a favor? No, I'm not worrying about this because I'm talking about worry tonight. But would you please pray for no snow on the 18th? I'm just so afraid there's going to be a blizzard that day and everything. I don't know. See, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. That's all I can say. All right. Um, so make sure you're cool with all of that. Uh, in order, again, one more thing about that. Uh, on the table on the way out, there are some little cards like this. We would love for you to pick up a card or two and fill out. There's three types of cards, things that you're excited about the future, things that you're thankful for the past. And Jessica, what was the third one? Favorite memory, that's the part I forgot. So you can pick one of those three cards, and if you would just fill that out, and we're going to stick them around so you uh, put them on the tables at our celebration uh, as a way of just sharing our memories and our thoughts. So grab a couple of those on the way out. You can fill them out, and there's a little slot that you can put them right away as well. All right, our Celebration Lutheran School is doing a fundraiser for their um, curriculum. They need new science books, which, as you know, are not cheap. Uh, so they'll be selling those great Fox Valley coupon books. Have you seen those? For $25, there's like a gazillion coupons in there that you can use here in the Valley. If you want to get one of those after church, someone will be selling those. Uh, if you want to order some Easter flowers, there's a form out on the table where you can uh, purchase those flowers that we'll use to decorate the church, and then you can take them home after Easter. We are also uh, selling faith apparel. 
So if you'd like some uh, shirts with our jackets with the Faith logo on it, or if you'd like to get some coffee cups or mugs or things like that with our logo on it, uh, you can get some stickers with our 75th anniversary logo, all those sort of things. In your announcement folder, there is a website that you can go to get that sort of stuff and information about how that can get ordered for you. All right, let me see. I think I've done well on my list. Lots of things going on here at church. I hope you find your way to get plugged in. All right, last thing of all. Uh, these next two weeks, this week and next week before the 18th, we've asked some people in our church to share some of their stewardship stories, uh, some way that God has touched them or blessed them through faith. And so tonight, Bob Larson is here, who is going to share with us uh, his story. So Bob, would you come on forward? Bob is a great guy, no matter what his wife Jody says. And we are thrilled to have him share a little bit with you about his story. I think she's probably said that before, so... Thank you, Pastor Dan. As we celebrate our 75th anniversary as Faith Lutheran Church, I was asked to just share with each of you a, a faith story, a recent story maybe about how God has worked through Faith Lutheran Church to have an impact on my life. And I considered a lot of different things, trust me. Um, there's many things that I could talk about. But God directed me to something that I believe is the epitome of Faith Through the Generations campaign. Jody and I um, exited Faith Ministry Center on Christmas Eve. There was a couple who was trying to help an elderly woman get into the front seat of an SUV. And she was from a wheelchair and they were trying to lift her up. So I offered my assistance and we were successful in our ability to get her in. The two family members were actually from Madison. But they come to Faith to take this woman to church every Christmas Eve. They said, we love this church. It is so beautiful and so meaningful. The daughter said, we take mom here because she is one of the original founding members. As I helped buckle her in, I thanked her for her faith in what would eventually become Faith Lutheran Church. I told her why I love faith, the impact that it's had on my life. And without saying anything, she looked me in the eye, she smiled, and she nodded with great joy and gratitude, with what I revelation that was a culmination of seeing and knowing firsthand how her commitment of 75 years ago made a difference. It was as if her faith, her assurance of things hoped for, and her conviction of things not yet seen from 75 years ago was now being affirmed in the words of gratitude and appreciation that I was sharing with her. I realized at the time but this is why I said yes and why God directed me to her. It was for me to recognize the impact of faith Lutheran in my life and of ours. One generation will commend your works to another, and they will tell of your mighty acts. As Pastor Aaron shared last week, in loving God, there are no excuses. And Faith Lutheran Church, you have had no excuses. Consider for a moment, you've taught thousands of children about the love and forgiveness shared your building and resources with others that meant the work of the kingdom. You've given gifts to nonprofit organizations in our community to share the love of Jesus. You've worked in your community through faith and action to demonstrate love and compassion for your neighbors and families, less numbers of children. You shared God's world. You are educating God, but rather embraces it as core to its purpose. You've taught hundreds of people weekly in Bible studies and worship, not only here, but thanks to technology across the world from the Northwoods to California, Arizona, and Florida, and And thanks be to God for the faith of our generation that we might pass along our faith to those who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, our visitors, to our community and world. One generation will commend your works to another, and they will tell of you. Thank you, Bob. Maybe we'll get some new microphones with the uh, capital campaign funds, too. <laughs> It's good to share the good news. All right, let's stand, everybody, as we worship our amazing God together this evening.
There's always a reason to praise the Lord. Each and every day we choose to sin and abuse God's grace. And yet God's love is abundant and his mercy is never ending. During this next song, I'd like you to take a lead, listen, listening to the spirit. And if that means sitting, if that means closing your eyes, if that means singing, if that means just standing and listening to what God is speaking to you. This song is a song of repentance and we daily need to do this. We daily need to repent. So let's sing this song, Kyrie Eleison.
Our God is so amazing. It's really incredible if you think about it that God could demand anything he wanted from us. God could set some sort of standard that we had to meet before that he would love us or care for us or be present in our lives. But that's not our God. Our God's love for us is so full. It is so rich. It is so unconditional. And it is so free that whenever we come to him with our sins and our burdens and we cry, oh, Lord, have mercy, he doesn't hesitate. He throws up no obstacles. He wraps his arm around us and says, I know I love you. I hear you. And I still love you. And I sent my son to pay that price for you, to forgive your sins so that you can be clean, so that you can live with me forever. As your pastor, one of your pastors, it's my joy to remind you of a God like that, a God whose love for you is free, full, and unconditional, a God who loves you and forgives all of your sins, and a God who is with you today and for all eternity. Thanks be to God for his mercy in our lives. Amen. Please be seated as we continue to sing.
creation, Son of God and Son of Man. Truly I love Thee, truly I'd serve joy, my crown. And now we turn to the beautiful word of the Lord, the inspired, inerrant, infallible word. And tonight you'll hear God word, God's word teaches and encourages us to trust in him above all things, because when we are able to do that, There is no need for worry. First, from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans Come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free, the Lord gives sight to the blind, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. This is the beautiful word of the Lord. And now we turn to Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which God will bring about in his own time, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Again, this is the word of the Lord. And now we turn to Jesus' teachings recorded in Matthew chapter 6. And since these are his words, let's rise in honor to him. Jesus, the master teacher, said, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? 
See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. O oh, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now would be a good time for you to pull out the little blue aqua color. What is that, aqua? Pull out your outline anyway, your sermon outline as we work through the word of God tonight. And tonight our focus will be the gospel lesson, Jesus' teachings from Matthew chapter 6. And you see there on your outline, the title is The Truth About Worry. And I really want to drill into this verse Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25, do not worry about your life. This is our text. Well, there was a fella named Glenn who went to see his doctor. And he had the whole full checkup. You know, we all get those, those yearly checkups, right? And after the checkup, the doctor came in and said, Glenn, I've got some good news. You're going to live till at least 60. And Glenn said, I am 60. <laughs> and the doctor said, see, I told you so. And then Glenn had to get on a plane and he had to fly. He hated flying. He said to the stewardess, you know, this jet we're on, how often do these jets crash? And the stewardess said, well, sir, generally just once. <laughs> Glenn had a lot to worry about, didn't he? Worry. As you see on your outline, I think of all the commandments that God has given us. Do not lie, do not steal, do not cheat, do not bear false witness, you know, honor your parents, all the commandments. If you ask me, the hardest commandment to obey is printed on your outline from Philippians 4, 6. The word of God says, do not worry about anything. How are you all doing on obeying that commandment? That's a toughie, isn't it? To not worry, it's a hard one. I think it's something that we all struggle with. And I think Jesus knew this. Man, this section of scripture from Matthew chapter 6 he does some great teaching. He gives us these five beautiful truths about, about what worry really is and what it isn't. And then he also doesn't just tell us about worry, but then he gives us three little antidotes to worry, three things that we can do to overcome the, the sin of worrying in our lives. And so we're gonna look today at worry. We're gonna ask, Jesus said, don't worry, but how? I hope you know, right, that Jesus would never tell you to do something that was impossible for you to do. Do you know this about our Lord? I mean, he would never ask you to do something that he knew you were incapable of doing. So listen, if Jesus says, do not worry, that means it's possible to not worry. You follow my logic there, right? So what's the problem? Why do we worry so much? I think the problem is that we think somehow in our mind that if we just worry about our kids, if we worry about our husband or our wife, if we worry about our marriage, if we worry about our job, if we worry about the economy, if we worry that we'll have enough money, if we worry about the weather on February 18th that it's gonna snow, right? If we worry that we can somehow control the uncontrollable, we think that somehow by worrying about it, we can control things that we can't. That's why I wrote in your box, the biggest myth 
The biggest lie is the idea that I can control things by worrying about them. We can't. And Jesus is going to teach us those very things. So let's look at these five sort of things that Jesus said about worry. You're gonna have to fill in the blanks as we work through this together, right? But the first thing Jesus taught is this. Worry is unreasonable. You're gonna see that all five of these begin with the un. It's un-something, right? Jesus taught worry is unreasonable. Here's what he said. He said, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Do you see what Jesus is saying here? Worry is illogical. It's unreasonable. It doesn't make sense to do it. He says there's more important things to worry about than the things we usually worry about. Really, if you look, what he said is that we worry about the wrong things. It's like he said, if you're gonna worry about something, worry about things that are eternal, like life and your body. But don't worry about the things that are external, things like food and clothing. See, he says some, it's unreasonable because we worry about the wrong things. He also said to worry about things that you can't change doesn't make any sense. It's illogical, it's unreasonable. And worry always exaggerates the problem, doesn't it? When you worry about something, it always gets bigger than it really is. So you see, the first thing he teaches us is that worry is unreasonable, it's illogical. Second, he said worry is unnatural. Here's what I mean by that. Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And why worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Jesus, the master teacher, gives us a little nature lesson about worry. He says, take a look at the birds. Birds have no worries, no cares. They flit from one thing to another and they don't worry. And yet God provides for them. And then he says, look at the flowers, look at a lily. Look at the beauty and the intricacy of a beautiful flower. And God cares for the flowers. It's like Jesus says, look around you. Animals don't worry. Plants don't worry. Do you know the only thing in all of God's creation that worries? Do you know what it is? Human beings. Why? It's unnatural to worry. We weren't made by God to worry. We were not born to worry. It's not natural. Now, I know people that say to me, I'm a born worrier. Have you heard folks say that? I can't help it. I cannot help be a worrier. Well, you're not a born worrier. You're not. Worry is a learned behavior. It's not natural. It's not how God created us. We learn how to worry from our parents, from our families, from our friends, from culture, from television, you know, from our own sinful selves. Worry is a learned behavior. It's not a born behavior. You're not born worrier. That's not true. And the good news is if worry can be learned, it can also be, you know what I'm going to say, right? Unlearned. Don't ever think that you can't change, that you can't stop worrying. Jesus says worry is unnatural. It's unreasonable, it's unnatural. And third, it's unhelpful. He said, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? It's like Jesus saying, why bother? It doesn't do anything. It does no good. Worry can't make you taller. Worry can't make you shorter. Worrying can't make you thinner. Worrying can't make you heavier. Worrying can't add another day to your life. In fact, I believe worry shortens your life. You ever heard someone say, I'm worried sick about this? That's what worry does. It makes us sick. It's bad for us. It, it, it's, it shortens our life, not makes it any longer. So listen, you can't change the past. You can't change the future. Worry only messes up today. It's not helpful. 
It's unreasonable, it's unnatural, it's unhelpful. Fourth, it's unnecessary. Here's what Jesus said about that. If God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he surely care for you, O you of little faith? Why should we worry when God promises to take care of us? You know, as soon as God became your father, he assumed care for your life. God is your father. Good fathers care for their children. I remember growing up, whenever I needed something, I asked my dad for it, and he would give me what I needed. If I needed some new shoes, because my feet grew fast when I was little, he would give me new shoes. If I needed new pants, because I grew tall when I was little, he gave me new pants. I never thought, man, I wonder if dad's going to provide for me. I knew he would, because he was my father. And our Father God here, did you see that in the passage? Says that he will surely care for you. Another verse of scripture, Philippians 4.19 says, God will supply all your needs. Friends, that's a Bible promise. God will supply all your needs. Notice what it doesn't say. God will supply all your needs if you work hard if you arrange and control your circumstances, if you worry about things long enough, then God will provide for your needs. No, it's a simple promise. God will provide for all your needs. That's a Bible promise that you can take to the bank. Now, let's be clear. It didn't say God will provide for all of your greeds. It said he will provide for all of your needs. God will give you whatever you need for life. So to worry about our needs is really not trusting God, is it? And that leads me to the fifth and final truth about worry. It's unreasonable, it's unnatural, it's unhelpful, it's unnecessary. And if you flip your outline, it is unchristian. Now, this wasn't me that said this. This is Jesus. He said, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need him, need them. You see what Jesus is saying? When we worry, we're acting like a pagan, like an atheist. We're acting like God doesn't exist or that God doesn't care or that God's not able to follow through on what he promised that he would give us all we need. That's a pretty strong statement that Jesus made, isn't it? Worry is actually unchristian. I just did a funeral yesterday and one of the family members said to me, I don't know how I would get through this if I didn't have God. You see, unbelievers, pagans, they have something to worry about because they've got to figure out life. They're out there trying to make ends meet all on their own. We who believe and trust in an amazing God who loves us so much that he's promised to provide for all of our needs have it so much easier, don't we? When we believe and trust that God is going to give us what we need, it frees us to live life to the fullest. So are these five beautiful truths that Jesus teaches us about worry? And I love how he doesn't just leave it there. And that he also gives us then these three antidotes, these three things that we can do to overcome the sin of worry in our lives. First, if you're filling in blanks, right? First thing, the antidote to worry is Jesus said, put God first in every area of your life. In our text, here's what he said. Your heavenly father already knows perfectly well what you need and he'll give them to you if you give him first place in your life and live as he wants to, wants you to. Did you hear? Worry goes away when we give God first place in our lives. So the way I look at it, worry is like a little warning light that flashes in your life. It's a warning sign that something in your life is out of balance. If you're worrying about something, it's a warning that you've put something above God, that there's something that, that's causing you concern that's taken first place in your, in, your, in your life. 
Why is it that the first of the Ten Commandments is this? You shall have no other gods before me. I think it's because God knew that as soon as we put anything above him, then we begin to worry, then we begin to fret, then we begin to worry that we're gonna lose that thing and we begin to try and protect that thing and then that thing or that person becomes an idol that turns us away from God. So Jesus said, antidote to worry is make sure you've got your priorities right. Make sure that God is your number one. Make sure you're trusting in him for everything, for peace, for joy, for forgiveness, for your security and for your needs. Because if you do, then nothing else can get in the way. As long as we love anything in this world more than we love God, that thing or person will become a source of worry because we will be afraid of losing it. So antidote to worry, put God first. Second, Live, Jesus said, just one day at a time. Live just one day at a time. Here's how he said it. So don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will have its own worries. Each day has enough trouble of its own, right? Here's how the Dan phrase of this verse goes. Don't open your umbrella until it rains. That's what Jesus is saying, right? Just worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. There's two days of the week that you should never worry about, yesterday and tomorrow, right? Today is what we have. Today is what we need to care for because if we worry about tomorrow, then we'll miss today's blessings and we'll pile more trouble in today than we need to. Jesus said each day has enough trouble of its own. I think it's striking that in teaching the Lord's Prayer, I printed this in your outline, Jesus said, give us today our daily bread. Why did he say daily twice? You know, in the Lord's prayer, Jesus said, you need to just focus on today. In your prayers, pray about today. Give us today our daily bread. Don't worry about yesterday. Don't worry about tomorrow. Pray for today. Put God first in every area of your life. Live just one day at a time. And the third antidote is trust God to care for all things beyond your control or that great bumper sticker, let go and let God, you know? Let go and let God. Again, uh, the verse I love about this from Philippians, it says, don't worry about anything, instead pray about everything. This antidote goes like this, don't worry, pray. Don't panic, pray. That's the lesson here, right? Did you know someone said in the Bible there's 7,000 promises that God makes to us? 7,000 promises that God makes to us, his children. So if you're panicked about something, if you're worrying about something, get in a Bible study. Learn God's word. The more you are in the word, the more you understand these beautiful promises that God makes to you, the easier it is to let go of panic and worry and fear and to trust and believe God fully. And the very bottom of your outline is this beautiful passage from Romans 8. This is the way I wanted to close all of Jesus' teachings here about worry for us. It says, since God didn't spare even his own son for us, but gave him up for us, won't he surely give us everything else? If God loved you enough to send Jesus Christ for you to die and forgive your sins, don't you think he will also take care of all of your needs? Don't you believe that he cares for you more than anything and he will be there for you? So trust God with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And when you put him first, you'll see that you can trust and believe and you'll live a life that is really life. So God bless all of you as you work on that worry and as you learn to trust in God and as he helps you to believe and trust him in all things. Amen. Well, friends, now is the time for our offering. This is a chance for us to give back to God for all he has given us. So I wanna thank you for your giving. These are the gifts we use to uh, share the name of Jesus in our world. So thanks for being a part of that mission. For those of you who are watching online on screen, you can see how you can text to give or you can visit our our website to give that way. If you wanna join us on that, we'd be grateful as well. Uh, And um, thankful for your giving.
Friends, let's bow our heads now and speak to our amazing God in prayer. And as we do so, we know that God hears, that God listens, and God always answers according to what he knows is best. We pray. Almighty God, through your incarnate son, Jesus, you have given us a teacher to listen to and to follow 
For you have said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. So help us, O Lord, to follow the teachings of Jesus so that we may avoid the pitfalls of worry in this world, the pitfalls that Satan uses to lead us away from your will and your truth. Lord, we pray that you would help us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us and to pray for those who persecute us. For Jesus, the great teacher said, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Lord, by your power, lead your enemies to true repentance and help us to forgive them just as you have forgiven us. Almighty God, your children endure pain and suffering every day, but you have given us a Savior who loves us and asks us to come to him when we suffer. For Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. By the power of your word, comfort those who grieve the loss of a loved one. We pray for the families of Al Brightlow and Jerry Marole, both called home to you this past week. Strengthen their faith and bless them with an extra measure of your grace and peace, O Lord. Grant us also your healing touch, especially to those who are battling an illness, those who are hospitalized, and those who are awaiting diagnosis or surgery. Tonight we lift up Sue Gregesic, Mark Savitas, Richard Gassman, Kim Leffring, those in our ongoing prayer list, and those we name in our hearts now. Lord of all goodness, reach down and touch them with your healing hand and love them and supply their needs. Lord, we also rejoice and give you great thanks for 75 years of your blessings here at Faith Church, for how you have worked, for the great things that you have accomplished and done through us, we give you thanks. And Lord, we are bold to pray and ask that you would be with us as we move into the next 75 years. We pray that you would bless our Faith for Generations campaign, that we might reach our goal of two and a half million dollars, so that we might prepare our buildings, prepare our parking lots, our roofs, prepare for our future of being used by you to reach the next generations with your love and grace. And now, O oh Lord, into your hands, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And together now we join in the prayer Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And as you go, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Shout out your friends. 